The member for Quinana. Mr Speaker, firstly, may I congratulate you on your election to the position of Speaker. I note that you are a member of the Murdoch University alumni like myself and welcome the ongoing success of former Murdoch students. I also pay my respects on this Remembrance Day to those who gave their lives in wars. I attended a service this morning of the Quinana um, RSL and pay tribute to those members of the Quinana community involved. I begin by acknowledging the Noongar people, the traditional owners on whose country we meet. I acknowledge their connection to this country, their rights and obligations to care for the South West and the ongoing spiritual and, active and cultural life they share with this region. Tonight, Mr Speaker, I make my inaugural speech with a great sense of humility and resolve. A sense of humility because I am debted to the people with whom I have shared the political journey thus far. And a sense of resolve because I know my work has just begun. And I am of a single mind to work tirelessly to make a contribution to help make Western Australia a, a better place for everyone to live. I draw some of my inspiration from the life and work of H.C. Nugget Coombs, a great and quiet public servant. Nugget was once dubbed Australian of the century. His conviction that government has an obligation to participate positively in the economic and social life of the community, to protect, raise and advance the lives of people and the economy is a valuable central guiding principle. Later in his life, Nugget served as an advisor to the Aboriginal leadership and sought to provide what skills he could bring to bear to assist them meet their aspirations as First Australians. I never met Nugget, but have tried to emulate his approach when working with communities, and it is his commitment to a per and a personal contribution to their lives of the most disadvantaged in our community that guides my sense of service. Mr Speaker, I believe the measure of any society is the way it treats its most disadvantaged and defenceless. The wealth of a few is worthless if, for others, the basic human rights they deserve are being undermined by laws economic systems or political and social policies or simple indifference. Human rights are the building blocks of a democracy. In the case of Aboriginal people, their rights as citizens are also qualified and extended as first peoples of our lands. My conviction on the rights of Aboriginal people are informed by the principles that were instilled in me by my magnificent parents, Hugh and Lynn. Their guidance in life was never sermonised but rather offered and constantly reinforced by behaviour. They taught me the principle, the importance of principle and the often inconvenient but important paths this takes on life's own decisions. Mr Speaker, I want to share with you the image of a family marching seven young kids along seemingly endless beaches to reach fishing holes that would probably easily access by car. Upon reaching that swimming hole, my family would catch only the amount of fish that was necessary for the next meal and leave even when the fish were biting, still biting. Hugh and Lynn offered the lesson that the journey travelled is often more important than the destination reached. And whether it was in attending a rally or engaging in excited debate over the dinner table, they taught me that passion is an important furnace that should be constantly fired in all our bellies in seeking social justice. I'm also indebted to Hugh for the knowledge and support he provides in my shadow portfolios. These lessons were able, also ably supported by my siblings, David, Gillian, Veronica, Helen and Doug, who all carried me, cajoled me and demonstrated the important principles, life principles handed to us by our parents. And in the case of Doug, these principles were often supported with a healthy shared passion for sport and adventure. I also pay, tribute, pay a short tribute to my late brother Richard, who left us well before he should. He parted our company before I could ever appreciate him properly as a person, but left, as a big brother should, as one of my childhood heroes. I would also like to thank and acknowledge my family, Carly Lane, Tobias and Isabel. I acknowledge their love, strength and support, as well as their capacity to keep my feet firmly on the ground. 
Mr Speaker, in 2000 I joined an organisation called Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation, or ANTAR. I sought ANTAR out through friends because of the legislation being considered at that time by the State Parliament to limit the full rights Aboriginal people should enjoy under the principles and laws of Native Title. Working for Senator Chris Evans, who at the time was Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Native Title and the Indigenous Land Fund, I was appalled by the attacks on Aboriginal people by the State Government of the day. ANTAR provided me with life-changing perspectives on the struggle for social justice. As one who had previously had little exposure to Aboriginal culture, I was able to reach out to Aboriginal experiences within a methodological framework that was sympathetic, supportive and culturally appropriate. I met and worked with a community of people that brought together conviction, faith, professional principles and academic rigour for a common support, common cause of supporting Indigenous rights. I would like to acknowledge local ANTAR activists, Tao Mackay, Stephen Hall and Carol Innes, and Carolyn Betts, and previous National President Phil Glendinning and ANTAR National Directors David Cooper and Gary Harland. I'm also indebted to ANTAR, as it was my role within that organisation that gave me the opportunity to work at the WA Aboriginal Native Title Working Group, and with great colleagues such as Patrick Dodson, Brian Wyatt, Peter Yu, Dennis Egerton, Eggington, and later in Aboriginal Rights with Larissa Berendt and Glenn Kelly and others. I remember attending early meetings of WANTAG and being struck by the Indigenous leadership strength of character, intellect and political analysis. These experiences were reinforced during my time at the Yamaji Malba Barnababa Marja Aboriginal Corporation, also known as the Yamaji Land and Sea Council and Pilbara Native Title Service, and the Southwest Aboriginal Land and Sea Council. Glenn Kelly, in particular, has guided my thinking on the application of human rights principles in public policy, and I acknowledge the friendship, support and love of Glenn and Donna Oxenham and their daughter, my godchild, Talia. Mr Speaker, I come to this place with a reputation as an advocate for the Indigenous cause, and this of itself would be a worthy mantle. It is not the Indigenous nature of the cause, however, that fuels my passion for Indigenous rights. Rather, it is the fact that the plight of Indigenous people in our society is the most debilitating and urgent of all social justice issues confronting the West Australian community. We have, in social and economic terms, nothing short of a fundamental failure of our society. This is not an Aboriginal problem. It is, a, it is the fact that while they share the most acute of all social, economic, political and physical social indicators of disadvantage, we are all diminished as a society, as Western Australians. While Aboriginal people experience the life expectancy 15 years less than non-Aboriginal people, we are all diminished. While Aboriginal people continue to live in substandard housing without adequate power, water and utilities, we are all diminished. While so many young Aboriginal people continue to grow up in a world in which they are all too often overcome with despair and take their lives, we are all diminished. While Aboriginal people are 13 times more likely to be jailed, and while a majority of young prisoners are Aboriginal when they constitute only 3% of the population, we are all diminished. While, as Archie Roach recently said, Aboriginal people living in urban areas remain some of the most isolated and remote communities in our society, we are all diminished. And while Aboriginal people have so little control over their lives because we have failed to acknowledge their dispossession and provided the recognition of their governance and inalienable rights as the Indigenous people of Western Australia, then together we are diminished and fail to fulfil our destiny as a whole society. On the 13th of February 2008, the Rudd government issued an apology to the stolen generation on behalf of the nation. This was an important and powerful symbolic act, but more needs to be done. I believe that Western Australia should have a constitutional recognition of its First Peoples, and I believe that this recognition should be backed by a Bill of Rights that enshrine not only Aboriginal rights, but indeed citizens' rights. This recognition should follow a lengthy and informed debate 
negotiate, debate in, in negotiation and dialogue with members of the Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. I don't come to this, this debate as a sympathetic observer. I come to it as an active stakeholder. I want my kids to grow up in a country that is reconciled, that has reconciled its present social perspective with its colonial historical origins. To participate in a proud society that has confronted its historical circumstances, embraced the differences and is resolving its future together, allowing all cultures to enrich our lives. This is the Western Australia I want. There is much, Mr Speaker, that needs to be done in Western Australia to improve the physical lives of Aboriginal people, to raise the living standards of many, Aboriginal, of many WA communities. For the most part, these physical issues are a precondition for forming meaningful governance models for communities. You can't expect a community that is so socially and economically neglected to all of a sudden be a model of good government. But another precondition for any process to rectify the circumstances that a lot of Aboriginal communities confront is to codify the rights they possess as First Peoples of the country and to sit down, negotiate and reach agreement about the broad issues of coexistence and of, co of our common worlds. On this point, Mr Speaker, I also conclude my remarks on the issue of resolving, acute social, of resolving this acute social justice issue. There is no single answer for resolving the social and economic issues confronting Aboriginal communities. The answers are found in a patchwork of ideas, activities and initiatives that are exploding everywhere around the country. The answers are everywhere and everyone has a stake in the solution. The answer lies in the work of June Oscar and Emily Foster and the other women of Fitzroy Crossing as they fight the impact of alcohol in their community. The answer lies in Charlie Kit with Charlie Kickett as he works with and mentors young Aboriginal people in Quinana. The answer lies with the Australian Employment Covenant and its work with Warren Mundine to create 50,000 jobs. And the answer lies with the health group, Yorgum, as they provide culturally appropriate family counselling services in their community. We need to harness what works and learn from what doesn't. The solution, however, is not in picking single solutions and suppressing people's human rights. It is in listening, hearing, negotiating and acting with resolve and strength. Listening is an important element of successful communities. Before coming to this place, I worked and studied in the area of public relations. I want to spend some time discussing this area because I believe the elements of excellence in public relations as pioneered by James and Larissa Grunig underpin the principles of good governance and citizenship. The Grunigs and other academic thinkers discuss the importance of organisations undertaking two-way success symmetrical communication. This process involves companies, governance and other organisations that seek a social licence to operate in our community undertaking to inform and be informed by their stakeholders, the people and groups they interact with. Governments in particular have an obligation to shape its behaviour and approach via an open dialogue with the community. It is from this perspective that I'm a proud practitioner of public relations. I'm not proud of those who have undermined this industry, but consider the relationships that government and the community keep as fundamental part of a healthy democracy. Governments that fail to maintain strong and healthy relationships with its constituencies deny themselves of any extraordinary array of experiences, ideas and innovations from which government can benefit. Dialogue and innovation are of course also important principles of sustainable communities. It is only within the firm focus of the three areas of environment, community and the economy that we will achieve something approaching sustainability in our part of the world. These are all elements that come into sharp focus in the community of Quinana. Quinana was established in 1952 with the passage of the Industrial Development Act to service the emerging industry of what is now known as the Quinana Industrial District. The area of Quinana is a living example of all the genuine tensions of sustainability. According to the Medina Residence Group, the township of Quinana was to be located north of its current location, nearer the Quinana Industrial Estate. The young town planner, Margaret Fieldman, charged with the responsibility of designing the new township, insisted that the town be located further south in order for the residents to be out of the, of the likely airshed of pollutants brought by the prevailing southwest winds from the nearby industry. 
Since that day, the town of Quinana has continued to live alongside industry in a managed but at times difficult relationship. Many of the people who moved to Quinana, including those who came from England and other migrant nations to work in the industrial strip, continue to live there now. It is a tight-knit community with a proud working history and a strong sense of identity. Quinana is also enjoying a rejuvenation as new families join the community and add to the established suburbs of Medina, Callista, Aurelia and Parmelia in the newer suburbs of Leda and even more recently Bertram and Wellard. The electorate is also rimmed by the Rockingham coastal suburbs of Coolangup, Woodbridge, Hillman and Waikiki. The Quinana electorate enjoys high environmental values with many trees and open spaces, a hallmark of Margaret Fieldman's work. In the southern and eastern ends of the electorate, the community continues to enjoy the semi-rural settings of Baudivis, Casuarina, Wandi, Angatel and Mandogalup that compete for lifestyle and country with the spread of the metropolitan P Perth down the Quinana Freeway and the newly completed Perth to Mandurah railway line. The community must be supported to provide a lifestyle that people value. The electorate of Quinana has a community that strongly values the lifestyles offered. It might be a horse-friendly property in Wandi, a small farmlet in Baudivis, a new home in Bertram or an established, and histori or an established home in the historical precinct like Medina. Quinana is a living example of the struggle to provide sustainability in the community. The interests of, the indus of industry must be acknowledged. Many people in the electorate within the industrial area know, know this is important for the sustainability of the economy and employment. Quinana industry directly employs 4,800 full-time, 2,800 part-time and indirectly 26,000 people. Its output is around 15.7 billion per year. It is an intense centre of activity with industry participants working together in a new, unique way to integrate their operations, work in harmony with the local communities and protect the environment in which it operates. As the Member for Parliament in this unique industrial environment and social setting, I commit myself as a strong defender of the Coburn Sound and surrounding Quinana and Rockingham environments and to playing a constructive role with those dedicated industry and community groups like the Quinana Industry Council and the Quinana Progress Association towards creation of a sustainable community in the Quinana electorate. And I might, Mr Speaker, request a short extension at this stage. Extension granted. Mr Speaker, the future of the Perth and West Australian economy is intertwined with the region of the global economic community in which we live. We, we should not base our future on being a Western rump of the Australian economy. Instead, we should be looking to, the, to be a pivot for the Indian Ocean economic rim that will play an increasingly important part of our lives and provide the focus for our economic future. Rather than looking east for leadership and direction for our economic future, we should be leading the nation as an active partner in our regional economy. We should be engaging as a step to be a stepping stone for the Australian economy and a fulcrum for the emerging and established economies of Africa, the Middle East, the subcontinent and Southeast Asia. WA must move to meet these needs of the regional economic community through a revolution in its educational, cultural and political direction. We must develop our human capital through innovation, education, education opportunities, strong trade and industry development policies and above all turn Perth and WA into a cultural exchange centre of ideas, art and learning to nurture and develop the relationships that are necessary to promote a centre for international economic and social exchange. Mr Speaker, the journey to becoming a Member of Parliament is only undertaken with the input, assistance and inspiration of many friends, family and colleagues. I would like to conclude by acknowledging the role of some of my friends and the Labor Party comrades who have battled, supported and encouraged me to progress. Simone McGurk, the Quinana Campaign Director, my Campaign Manager Kieran Cranny, Dave Kelly, State Secretary of my union, the LHMU. Simon Mead, ALP State Secretary, and Fiona Henderson, and Senator Chris Evans. And of course, I acknowledge the support of local rank and file, ALP rank and file supporters, 
such as Barry and Geraldine Gilbert and Kath Gallup, whose support has been unwavering, along with other members of the Quinana, Hilton and Rockingham Safety Bay sub-branches of the Australian Labor Party. I would like to thank Daniel Smith and the team at CPR Communications and Public Relations in Perth and CPR Senior Management Adam Kilgow, Josh Williams and, of course, my valuable friend Eric Locke. In particular, Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank my very good friends and comrades, the Honourable Ken Travers and the Honourable Sue Ellery and the member for Fremantle, the Honourable Jim McGuinty. Sue and Jim have been my two, two of my greatest critics and greatest supporters. Ken Travers, in particular, has been an extraordinary friend in both my political and professional life, and I am very proud to, to serve in the same parliament as he, even though he had to wait 20, 12 years for me to get here. Mr Speaker, the parliament is a place in which many have invested trust and faith in a few to adhere to important convictions of principle and see them embedded in honest deeds. I am aware that my election as Deputy Leader of the Labor Party and appointment as Shadow Minister for Health, Mental Health and Indigenous Affairs has placed a greater onus on me to work hard to promote good policy for and with the people who share an interest in these important policy areas. I commit myself to this task as the member for Kunana and look forward to working with all colleagues to serve the people of Western Australia.